Welcome. You're tuned to the Urban Affairs Program. It's time to get up for Urban Perspectives with your host, Pete Rhodes. Welcome. You're watching Urban Perspectives. I'm your host, Pete Rhodes. On this edition of Urban Perspectives, we discuss elementary and post-secondary disparities and opportunities. Plus, we'll meet the Council on Black Minnesotans to discuss the creation of policies that affect communities of color on this episode of Urban Perspectives. My first guest is president and CEO, co-founder of Seed Academy and Harvest Preparatory School. He has more than 25 years of educational experience. He's been featured on CNN, highlighting the school's success in educating black boys. And his mission is to inspire youth and provide a high quality educational experience. Please welcome Eric Mahmoud. Eric, thanks for being here with me. Thanks for having me. You know, uh, we were just talking a little bit about how far back we go. <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a while, yes. and uh, it is so uh, in exciting to see the the advancing and the advancement that is happening with uh, you and the, and the schools over there doing just a fantastic job. But we can't, we'll be remiss if we said we're not facing uh, a, a crisis in our community in education. Some say it's the teachers, some say it's the parents, some say it's the system. What do you say it is? Well, I think every one of those components ha has a part in the problem and also the solution. Over the past 30 years that I've been involved in education, I've basically distilled this achievement gap into five gaps. Uh, first, you have the preparation gap. We know that most of the achievement gap shows up to school even before children start school. So mm -hmm. before they start kindergarten, there's a wide achievement gap. My former football coach used to talk about the five Ps, proper preparation prevents poor performance. So exactly. our children need to be prepared. Because they come to school behind, the only way we're gonna close that gap is to give them more time and support. So that time gap is important. Mm -hmm. Then the third gap is the teaching gap. We have to have great teachers for the children with the most needs. The fourth gap is the leadership gap. The leader is responsible for aligning the systems, the culture, the academics, all pointing towards student achievement. And really the widest gap is the belief gap. Mm -hmm. And so if students don't believe in their capacity, if teachers don't believe in the capacity of the children, that they're not going to be successful. So I think that those are the five areas that we have control over mm -hmm. that we can make a difference for our children. Now parenting is such an important part of that leadership uh, portion that you talked about as well, getting that coming out of the household. How important is it for parenting uh, to to uh, uh, step in and, and be a positive force. And I, I remember coming to school, I, I used to be afraid to go uh, uh, come home with bad grades because I knew my mom was gonna go to PTA right? and she would find out different things. And, but it was, it was that parenting that also I remember so fondly. Absolute Pete. So we know that the child's education is a product of two educational institutions. Mm -hmm. So the school is an educational institution and the home is an educational institution. And so it's important that parents understand their impact on a child's learning. So it, it, again, it's tied to that preparation gap. We know that children at three years old, children that low income children, they have a 500 word vocabulary mm -hmm. at three years old. Upper income children have a 1200 word vocabulary. So there's a 700 word gap between low income children and upper income children even before they start school. And the difference is, is the amount of vocabulary, the, the amount of conversations that parents are having with their children. So parents make a significant impact on the, on the proficiency, on the education of children. Can't leave it to the games, can't leave it to television. Absolutely. You gotta read to your kids. If they see what you're doing, they'll emulate that as well. Right, they, they see you picking up a book and appreciating uh, literature and also uh, math, then they'll certainly appreci gain an appreciation for those. Now, for a while and still continues the debate. How good or which is the better public charter can you explain the difference for our audience? Yes, yeah, so there's a false debate. I mean, you, you can have phenomenal 
public schools, you can have phenomenal charter schools, you can have dismal charter schools and also public schools. But one of the things that I can tell you is that if you look over the past seven years, the Star and Tribune has a report of the, the beating the odds schools. Mm -hmm. These are the schools that are top schools in the state of Minnesota mm -hmm. that are serving low income and children of color eight out of the ten schools that are featured are charter schools. And one of the reasons charter schools uh, has, have a little bit more flexibility, it opens the opportunity for entrepreneurship to get great ideas into the educational system. Sometimes the bureaucracy of public schools holds the advancement of education back. So charter schools gives people the ability to be innovative. That's the only difference. Is it as well better for our students of color? Well, I can't say it's just because there's charter schools that are actually failing, mm -hmm. but again, what it does is it puts the power in the hands of the community. We don't have to wait for bureaucracies to solve our problems. We can solve our own problems. I have an engineering degree, mm -hmm. so I wasn't trained as an educator, but I had a passion for community development, and the charter school legislation gave me the opportunity to create a school using innovative practices, and now our school has been recognized as one of the top schools in the country. I want you, with the 10 seconds that we have left, tell us about the uh, growth in the school, the new advancement, the new operation. Well, we're excited. We actually have 1,100 students this year, and we're going to 4,000 over the next six years. We want to actually create and control 51% of the seats in North Minneapolis. That's an important factor, and we thank you so much for being here, and congratulations on the new moves. Thank you for having me. All right. Up next, we speak with the new president of Normandale Community College about her goals for expanding opportunities at one of the largest community colleges in Minnesota. Join me for my conversation with Dr. Joyce Esther here on Urban Perspectives. Welcome back to Urban Perspectives. The Chancellor of the Minnesota, College, uh, Minnesota State Colleges and Universities had this to say about our next guest. Inclusive, transparent, and a collaborative leader with a proven commitment to success of all students. It's my honor to welcome Dr. Joyce Esther to Urban Perspectives. I just got the whole mystery <laughs> thing just boom. That's okay. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, we, we uh, hail from, not maybe necessarily hail from the same uh, neck of the woods, but uh, you had a stint in Chicago at Kennedy King. Yes, I did. Yeah, yes. So uh, we know well about Kennedy King. So thanks for being here. Thank you. I, I guess I want to ask you, uh, what were your inspirations that brought you to become and make a career in education? Well, you know, I think I've always been one of those kinds of folks who always wanted to help people and be with other folks. And I love to talk, and I'm a little chatty Cathy. So um, I initially wanted to be a social worker. That's what I wanted to do. And when I went to school um, to be a social worker, I was working in housing on um, Northern Illinois University's campus. Mm -hmm. And I got bit by the student affairs bug and the opportunity to work with college students, particularly working with students outside of the classroom and yeah. really being able to be a part of students' growth and development. And I was like, this is a career that I can really wrap my, heads around, my hands around. And so I just kind of progressed in my career, staying a lot in um, student affairs, which really focused on a lot of the co-curricular things that happen in a student development in addition to what happens in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And then I just you know, went back to school, got the degrees that you needed to get yeah. and all that good kind of stuff, but really wanting to work with students and really having to make an impact on student lives. And so one day I had a mentor say to me, what is it that you want to do? And I spoke out loud, I want to be a president. Yeah. And so she put me on the path and said, well, okay, then you need to do what you need to do to get there. And here I am. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations on it. Uh, you know, you are now hitting up one of the largest uh, community colleges in the state. Uh, Normandale has over 15,000 students there. What are your plans on your administration to uh, expand on the greatness that's happening over there? 
Yeah, well, you know, I am so very fortunate to be at Normandale. Normandale is an amazing school with an amazing legacy. But first and foremost, my opportunity, I've been there two weeks, mm -hmm. um, and it'll be my opportunity, first and foremost, to listen to the community, listen to our faculty and our staff and our students, and really hear about how they got to be as great as they are, so that yeah. we can really expand on some of those programs. Mm -hmm. um, we had, a couple years ago, we built um, a partnership center that really allowed us to allow students to get not only their associate's degrees, but get bachelor's and master's degrees on our campus through our partners with four-year institutions. Wonderful opportunity. And so my job is really to fill that program and to build all of our programs to make sure folks really know all of the educational opportunities that they have. And so um, we really want to market. You know, we know how great Normandale is, but sometimes I don't know if other people know that. So my job is to get out there, beat the bushes, make sure everyone knows the academic progress that we've been making at that institution. We are one of the, the, the largest and the fastest growing transfer institutions to the University of Minnesota and other four-year institutions. So for a lot of people who may want to start at a two-year institution, Normandale has a wonderful track record of making sure you transfer, transfer to the four-year institution. So I really want to be able to do some of those kinds of things and engage with our community. So Great I have a lot of work. Yeah. Oh, well, I hope so. Great spokesperson for I, I can so. see already. Well, you know, how important has the uh, student loan uh, this change in uh, their ability to not have that stress on them. Um, I know our president has worked uh, uh, to try to alleviate some of that debt problem. What do you think about that? Well, you know, I actually think that initially it's going to have a really great impact on folks who've left school mm -hmm. because of loans, right? Mm -hmm. Because really the repayment comes in after you've left school. Exactly. And so the impact for folks who might have left without their degree and they're thinking about this debt, well, that's something that they don't have to think about. They can mm -hmm. focus on their academic goals. They can focus on what they need to do to be successful in the classroom. And so I think that that's going to be very helpful because I've heard many stories of students who stay in school taking extra courses because they're fearful of stopping out because they have to start repaying see, loans. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so now knowing that you could take that off the table so that folks can focus on what it is that they need to do. Um, I also think that it is going to impact our students as we start to move along in this because it may start to decrease our default rates that we see and people defaulting on their loans because it's making it um, a lot more um, easy for people to be able to be successful. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that someone said to me when I got my first student loan is you got to pay it back because that's how somebody else gets it's a loan, exactly. right? And so exactly. if people aren't paying it back, we're also, you know, slow, uh, closing up the gap for other people to get yeah. loans. Yeah. But I think it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, I think for a lot of us, we'll be paying student loans for a very long, a long time. time um, but you know, I thank God that I have it because yeah. it allowed yeah. me to do what I needed to do. And so important, so important. Now, what do you think uh, from another aspect? What would you say to a senior who is now determining their next step right. for higher education? Well, first of all, I would probably say, I hope you started thinking about this before you were a senior. Yes. Um, we need to start talking to our kids about it when they're in elementary school, when they're in you know middle school. But if you are a senior and all of a sudden the light bulb comes on, you know it's not too late. There are wonderful opportunities. Get involved in the PSEO program here in Minnesota. Start taking some classes because I think one of the things is is young people sometimes don't understand the difference in in the educational processes in high school as it is to college. So you know, take some classes. Get your feet wet a little bit to understand what it's like to go from having a teacher to a professor and what is that like. So I would give those kind of opportunities for our students to make sure that they really focus on what it is that they want to do. A lot of our students come in and they have no idea what they want to do. Ask questions, meet people, talk to people Great so that advice. when you get to school, you know where you're going. Great advice. Joyce, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, you had great op uh, information and uh, we love to see you again. Please do. All right, Thank Joyce you. Esther, thank great. you. Weekly here on Urban Perspectives, we present Shining Stars, highlighting people, places, and events that contribute to the vibrancy of the urban community. Our Shining Star is brought to you by Continental Diamond, and this week is a legal expert in employment law, administrative law, and civil rights. She's currently the Associate Director of Civil Rights Investigation Division in the Minneapolis Department of Civil Rights. Here's a look at our Shining Star in her own words, Tony Newborn. My name is Tony Newborn. I am the Assistant Director of Civil Rights for the Minneapolis Department of Civil Rights. I attended undergraduate college at Birmingham Southern College in Birmingham, Alabama. And then um, in 2004, I started, attended William Mitchell College of Law, which is in St. Paul, Minnesota. You know, when I was in high school, I wanted to be a fashion designer. 
And in order to be a fashion designer, you need to learn how to sew <laughs> or have some sort of interest in art or um, you know painting and, and that sort of thing. And I didn't have either one of those interests. And so I asked my parents, my dad specifically, what should I be? And my dad said, you know what? You should consider being an attorney because you like to argue and you're loud at times. So my dad was my inspiration and I started to pursue law in undergrad, in college. So I started to take pre-law classes. I majored in political science at Birmingham Southern and then decided to take a year off between college and law school and I worked at a law firm, Bradley A. Rant Law Firm, which is in Birmingham, for one year, saved up all my little money and started William Mitchell in 2004. Think long and hard about it. Law school is expensive. College can be expensive. So if you are in high school or middle school, start working on your grades now so that you can get that scholarship. You don't have to take out any loans. And then really think about what, what it is that you want to do in life. What is your purpose? And what will make you happy? Not everyone else, but what will make you happy? And, that will, and start to form your decision and your path that way. But create a path because any road will lead you will, and will take you anywhere. I am Tony Newborn, and you are watching Urban Perspectives. This year marks the 500 plus year commemoration of the African American history in the United States. Coming up, we'll discuss African Americans in Minnesota and its future through the work of the Council on Black Minnesotans. We'll talk with legislative and public policy expert Edward McDonald next on Urban Perspectives. My next guest was raised in Wisconsin, but his heart lives in Minnesota. He's a graduate of the U of M Duluth and former public policy manager for Family and Children's Services. His mission is to enhance through public policy the quality of life and inclusion for African and African Americans in all aspects of our state. Please welcome the director of the Council on Black Minnesotans, Edward McDonald. Edward, thank you for being here with us. Well, Pete, it's always nice to be in your company, and uh, I'm happy to be here. I was telling my, uh, my partner that uh, you and I, when we first talked on the phone, we talked almost an hour about gardening and all kind of stuff. <laughs> That's right. It had nothing to do with public policy. <laughs> but explain to us, uh, Edward, if you can, in the audience, what is the Council on Black Minnesotans and its mission? Well, the council was created in 1980 by the Minnesota legislature. Um, we are essentially a quasi-state agency. Um, the purpose of the council is to ensure that Minnesotans of African heritage benefit from um, the policies, procedures, and economic resources of the state of Minnesota. Mm, interesting. So uh, you have a history of being involved in policy, coming out of Harvard and, and doing work in this area for such a long time. Uh, how important is it for us as a community to be a part of the issues and the push that you do on the back end? And that's not necessarily the back end, it's the front end in policy. Well, you know, I um, am a public administrator, trained social developer, community organizer, and um, paralegal. Mm -hmm. And um, in that organizing experience, um, I've learned that um, it's important for our community to engage um, political systems, the administrative operation of uh, public institutions, as well as corp uh, private institutions in order for our voice to provide some direction in how services and public policy is framed and mm -hmm. delivered within the marketplace. So yes, the council uh, in itself is owned by the community, mm -hmm. and uh, it is what fuel and drive what the council does. We listen diligently to our community across the state. It informs us. We engage them. We involve them in what we do, and we enable them to confront leaders across all institutions to make sure that um, what they do in the marketplace benefit our community. You and I talked earlier, and we talked about the, the efforts at the council as well as to talk about and to promote the better happenings, the, the good things that are coming out of this effort behind the policy. What are some of those things that have been happening under your administration thus far? Well, we've done uh, quite a bit of things. Um, uh, we've advanced uh, 12 legislative recommendations that we believe will eradicate 
disparities. We're not interested in closing gaps. Mm -hmm. uh, we think that the genius of Americans, the genius of Minnesotans have um, underperformed in that regard. And uh, so we continue to press, leading with um, strong enforcement of human and civil rights. Minnesota has a excellent history in that regard, but in recent years, the past mm -hmm. 20, we've not seen a net increase in funding for the enforcement of human and civil rights. We think some of the innovation uh, and progressiveness of Minnesota has been lacking and taking on challenges like disparities um, and uh, bringing forth policies that will eradicate those. Um, we have introduced 12 that um, got some serious consideration and we believe that in this next session, uh, depending on what happens in these elections, uh, we will make some advancement in that regard. How's it working with the uh, legislators uh, there at the Capitol? You have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with quite a few of them. We have um, uh, some excellent legislators. I think uh, one of the beautiful things about being in a state like Minnesota is that it is progressive in its nature. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you are challenged to be extremely innovative. Um, there is not much that hasn't been introduced in the marketplace yeah. in Minnesota. Yeah. So you are challenged uh, each and every day to uh, find new pathways to grow this uh, great community further. And uh, I love being in that environment. Uh, my council board does, and uh, it makes for some great thinking. We have some uh, excellent allies mm -hmm. uh, within the legislature, seasoned, uh, legislative uh, social political engineers and um, the uh, deliberations with them have been uh, excellent so far for me in the last two years. So what is the one next thing uh, that we should expect from uh, you guys over there? Well we've um, uh, are in the beginning stages of forming our legislative agenda this year. We've had um, uh, nearly 20 focus group discussions throughout the state uh, meeting with uh, Minnesotans of African heritage. Um, and we've uh, done statewide surveys, we're analyzing the information. And right now, the issues that seem to be emerging is uh, the deficiencies in uh, housing, mm -hmm. uh, both clean, safe, affordable rental housing, home ownership, uh, which builds wealth, uh, jobs, economic development, the disparities there. We may need to do some more things where we're targeting uh, economic development activity and labor surplus communities, which uh, African heritage people tend to uh, concentrate. Um, in addition to that, we need to really resolve the issues around education. Um, early childhood education needs to be absolutely free. We need more guidance counseling in the school systems cool. and we need free higher education access. Well, I wish you all the best in what you do and uh, we thank you so much for being here. We gotta get you back, no doubt, because there's so much to talk about. We need to do this all the time. Edward thank McDonald, you. thank you so much. Thank you for watching this edition of Urban Perspectives. I want to thank my guests, Eric Mahmoud, Dr. Joyce Esther, Edward McDonald. I'd like to thank my BMA and WCCO crew and you, the audience, for getting up with Urban Perspectives. And remember, there are positive things happening in our cities. See them here on Urban Perspectives. Now enjoy the photos of the week featuring the Minneapolis Public Schools 100 Strong Who Care. It's a mentoring program at Patrick Henry High School. I'm Pete Rhodes, and I'll see you next week.